two things I want to tell you right off the bat that I know about God. And we have Mark led us in the music to sing about one of them already. And that is that God is love. God is perfect. God uh, doesn't know how to do anything except that which is perfect. And because God is love and that is his nature, everything that he does is going to flow from that. So everything that he does is going to be loving. So number one, God is love. And number two, God wants you to join in that love relationship. He wants you to be a part of that. God's not holding back on us. It's not like God's up there hoarding all the love and then he just gives us, you know, just a, a breadcrumb every now and again. God knows you just the way that you are. God was, before you were formed, he knows everything in your DNA. He knows your personality through and through. And he wants to just absolutely pour out his love on you. As a matter of fact, throughout all of eternity, that's what we're going to get. He's not going to say, he's going to take all of the essence of the divine nature and pour it out on us. We get perfection forever and ever and ever. Does that make you feel good? If that doesn't make you feel good, I don't know what will. You can't get better than that. That's the one thing I know is I know God is a God of love, and I, I know that uh, he wants us to be part of that. He, he wants the best for us. He's not short-sighted. It's just simply this. Is it important for you to have what you want? Is it important for you to have what you think is best for you, or are you willing to trust God and God's best for you. Now, Satan, he wanted it all too. He was actually the garden cherub that covers. He was the, he was in the presence of God. Most scholars believe that Satan's job, and he had one, all of us have one, was to kind of like be the doorkeeper, to let who would be allowed into the very presence of God. You just didn't walk in. By the way, we get to just walk in. We get to go, we don't have to go through anybody. We can go straight into the presence of God. Matter of fact, we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace. But Satan's job in that day and time was to be in the very presence of God, and yet he made it about himself, and he failed a temptation. He talk, we talk about, we're going to talk about here in just a moment, the lust of the flesh, what we want, the lust of the eyes, that means what we see, and, and we bring in our thoughts, and those thoughts overrule the will of God. And the pride of life. Satan failed in all three of those. He thought he was as good as God. He wanted his power and his authority to be just as high as God's. And we know that that was sin. But it worked on Satan. And Satan used those very same th three things to work on Adam and Eve. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they fell as well. Listen to John's epistle, 1 John chapter number 2. Hear these words. Do not love the world. This place is not our home. We were not built to find our joy and our peace and everything satisfying in life from this world. This world is fleeting. You might think you've got a hold of it, and then you're going to get older, and you're not going to enjoy it as much. Then you're going to spend all your time going to doctors like I do and all those kind of things. The things that you think are going to make you happy are not going to make you happy in this world. So he says, don't fall in love with the way that this world does things. He said, do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. It's fleeting. It's here today and it's gone. You need something more than that. He said, if anyone loves the world, now this is an amazing statement. Y'all listen. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a powerful statement. That's a strong statement. He is saying if your heart is tuned in to what you're going to get here, what you, what you think is going to make you happy here, if that's where your allegiance is, the love of the God, the Father, is not in you. He says, for all that is in the world, here he describes it again, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says it's not of the Father, it's of the world. It's the trapping of this world. He said, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it. Here's the money statement again. 
But he who does the will of God, he who knows <clears throat> and does the will of God, abides forever. So the question is, <clears throat> since this world is not our home, and everything here is temporary, what are we going to do with our life? Is it going to be shaped around what we can get here? You have your Bible, Matthew chapter 4. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? <clears throat> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he, that is Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, here's the money statement, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's pray. Father, we uh, came because we love you. We sing because we want to praise you. We humble ourselves to your word. We are grateful for the gift of taking our thoughts to you in prayer, laying before you our being, our essence. We thank you for life. We thank you for all the things that you've given to us, glimpses of your love, things that show us your beauty, and Lord, you have so much for us. And Lord, today we want to hear from you. Father, I know I can speak to ears that it's temporary. It's quickly forgotten. But Lord, with the still small voice that you have, you're able to get through the noise of this world and speak to our hearts. And Father, you can make it permanent in our lives. The truths of God that will live with us throughout the remainder of our days. And that's what we ask for today, Lord. Lord, we ask that uh, our hearts will be humble before you. Speak to us personally. Give us ears to hear you, Holy Spirit. A heart that's open to obey. Father, do a God work in the next few moments. And sir, we'll give you all the praise and the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. He took him to the battlefield. The battle would be played out there between the two great forces in this world. The one who is the prince of the air, who has, has been given temporary uh, authority in this realm, and the God of all creation, the creator of all. And they were there in the wilderness, and the Bible says that Jesus, after he was led there, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days and 40 nights, he did not look to seek the, the, the pleasures of this world, but he knew that he would be facing something, and he placed himself under those circumstances. Listen, the will of God, the power of God, works in all circumstances. Sometimes we think, as long as things are good, then we can hear from God and God works. But God is big enough to work when everything is great, or he's also big enough and his power of his word is strong enough to help us in the worst of circumstances. That is our God. So we see himself there, and the tempter comes to him. I love this, because that's who Satan is. You see, the two are correlated. His being, who he is, and what he does, that is to tempt us to come and bring accusations or to come to lead us astray. That's, that's the essence of who he is. And we, as children of God, need to learn to turn a deaf ear to that. So he finds Satan there after he had been fasting for 40 days. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It might look that Jesus was alone. But was he really? Or was the Spirit of God with him? It may have looked like he had no resources, but wasn't God there to provide? He may have had a hunger, which, by the way, 
was a legitimate need. But he knew that there was something else that was even more important than that. Forty days. In Scripture, 40 is always the number for a trial. It's a season. It begins, but there's also an end to it. It's something that you go through for a time, a trial that you go through. When God spoke to Noah and told him to build a, the ark, he said that he was, by the way, he was a preacher of righteousness too. And he told everybody else, repent of your sins or judgment is coming. And at the right time, God brought the animals, put them on the ark. Noah and his family got on the ark, and God shut the door. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It was a trial. And the ones that were on the ark survived, and the others did not. Moses, when he was in the wilderness there, he went up on the Mount Sinai. Before he would get the commandments from God... He, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then he heard the voice of God and the finger of God and the Ten Commandments were given to lead the people. He put himself under the will of God. The spies who were sent into the promised land to spy it out to see if it was good or, for, or if it was not good. For 40 days they were there and they saw all the beautiful things. But they also saw the fortified cities and the soldiers and all that. It was a trial. Would they trust God or not? And the spies came back and said, 10 of them said, we can't do it. And the children of Israel went into the wilderness to die in the wilderness. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, trusted God and believed God. They're the only two that made it into the promised land. Think about Goliath, he came before the armies of Israel and he said, send, me, send forth a champion that we may fight and we will see whose God reigns. Forty days he came out there in the morning and evening and made the challenge. But on the fortieth day there was a young shepherd boy who heard it and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that blasphemes the name of God? And David came forward. David said yes to the trial. And the children of Israel were saved. The backslidden prophet of God, Jonah, who was sent to preach judgment to the Assyrian people, who ran from it. By the way, you can't run from God. God can find you wherever you are. God's able to speak to you no matter where you're at. And by the way, we need to learn to say yes. The longer we learn to say no, the harder it's going to be. We need to yield our hearts to him. When Jonah finally repented, he went to the city of Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, and for 40 days he preached to those pagan people, repent or the judgment of God was coming. And the Assyrians repented and God relented. When you think of Elijah, the prophet of God, who was there on Mount Carmel and prayed, and the fire from heaven came down and consumed the altar and showed all of Israel that he is God. Elijah, who did not fear the king or any army of Israel, became scared and ran from a woman by the name of Jezebel. God met him and fed him and gave him rest. Fed him again, gave him rest. Fed him again. And the Bible says that he traveled 40 days and 40 nights on the strength of what God had provided. And then after that, God showed himself to Elijah and the power. Jesus, after he was resurrected, was on the earth for 40 days. A trial, showing himself to them, really wanting to know, Will you believe? Though you see, will you believe or not believe? The disciples and others saw. The Bible even says that over 500 people saw him at one time. Here is the test. Is God real? Is he love? And if he is love, will he take care of you? The tempter came. 
and he tempted Jesus. Look what he says in verse 3. If you are the Son of God. Now this is a cherubim, a created being who was in the presence of God. He knew Jesus. He knew who he was. He knew he was the Son of God. Obviously he did. But here's something's different. Because when he was in his presence in heaven, he was the son of God. But now he's come to earth and he's taken on this form of humanity. And now he's the son of man. And he knew sin had come against him. He knew sin had come against Adam and Eve. He knew sin had worked against everyone else who had been born. And now Jesus had been born in human. And now he is wondering, will sin affect him too? If you are the Son of God, I know who you were, but if you are, command these stones to become bread. You know what he's saying here? Take matters into your own hands. Take up the power. Make it happen. This is an affront into what I'm going to call the providence of God. When I was studying this, a while back, it really moved my heart. And I, I, I began to be quiet in front of the Lord. Sometimes there's so much going on in my mind that I have trouble moving all that out of the way where I can hear the voice of God. And I know that God speaks in a whisper. So I said, Lord, speak to me for your servant is listening. And a word came to me that I hadn't thought about in years. Matter of fact, when I studied this scripture and I looked at other writers and what they had to say about this scripture, nobody ever said this word. But as soon as I heard this word, I went, actually I had my phone with me, and I looked it up, and it's the word providence. The word providence means this, divine care and guidance. When we speak of the providence, of God, that God is our sustaining power and our God through this very troubling world. So here's the question. Is what God provides enough or do we look for another? The children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, God came and gave them food every day. They called it manna. God fed them. Every day. God took care of their clothes, and for 40 years, when they were in the wilderness, their clothes did not wear out. Matter of fact, it says that their sandals did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. God took care of them. Every need that they had, God provided. They didn't do one thing on their own. They didn't have to take matters into their own hand. By the way, they did complain. God gave them food every day, but they said, that's not enough. We want more. We want something different. We're, we're thirsting to death. What are you going to do about giving us water? Even though God promised, listen, God promised that he would take care of everything from them. Instead of saying to God, thank you, oh God, that you love me. Thank you, oh God, that you care. Thank you, oh God, for doing for me what only you can do. Even then, they wanted something else. May it never be said about us. May it never be said about us. You know what Jesus said to us? In the Sermon on the Mount, he said to us to pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, would you take care of my day? First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all your cares upon him, for he... For he cares for you. Before you woke up in the morning, he knows what you need that day. Jesus prays for you. Jesus can provide for you. The providence of God goes before us. In that sixth chapter of Matthew, he says this. Therefore, this is where so many people live. Do not worry. Worry means you're not trusting in God. Worry means you're looking at the circumstances 
And you see the circumstances being bigger than God. So he says, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles, the unbelievers seek. Here's the money statement. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He knows your needs better than you. When you come in prayer, all you're seeking to do is take your heart and letting it mesh with God. He already knows your needs. I'm going to make a statement. I hope you hear. Before you ever get into the circumstance, before you ever face the difficulty, before you ever find yourself at deficit, God's already seen it and provided. So listen to Jesus' answer. When Satan comes and insults God's love and God's care and God's providence, Jesus answers back and said this, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Bread will feed you for a meal, but you'll get hungry again. The things of this world will give you something, but it's really a lie because they're going to fade away. Everything in this world is going to be gone. I have so much more. So much better. Man does not live by bread alone. But there are too many people in this world who are living by the bread of this world. What this world can give them. The fame that can give them. The reputation. The achievement. The scholarship. The friends. The clothes. The perfume. The foods. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Make the most of it, they say. Jesus says man does not live by bread alone, but listen to me now, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God. This is not everything God knows, but it's everything we need to know. Any question that you may have can be answered here. All the promises that God gave to you in this word are yes, they're for you. They're for you. They're God's special gift of love for you. Trust it. Accept it. Live it. Rely upon it. Stand upon it. Shout it from the mountaintops. Every word that proceeds from the Word of God. So when he said this, I will never leave you, say it again, nor forsake you. He's there. There's not a place that you can go that you can hide from the provident care of God. Ask Jonah. I mean, it may have been uncomfortable in the belly of the whale, but God met him there. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says this. This is a promise of God. This is a promise. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common. To man. I mean, it's not like you've got some bigger thing that someone else has never, nobody else has ever faced what you faced. No, they're all the same. By the way, you can lump them pretty much in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But God is faithful, Scripture says. Look up there on that screen. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able God's seen you. He saw your day. He knows what you're going to go through. There's some things he said, no, no, no. Satan, you can't do that. That's too heavy. That's too much. But if you're facing it with God's help, it's enough. You will not be allowed to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. Here's the money statement. That you may be able to bear it. That's a promise. We sing victory in Jesus. We need to start living and believing victory in Jesus. When the children of Israel went to the promised land, they could have walked all right in, in anyway. They just didn't trust God to provide there. What did it cost them? 40 years of funeral in the wilderness. And this, their children had to come up and do what the parents would not do, which was trust God. And every step that they took, God had already provided. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, 
For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. God's got this. But Satan wants us to doubt God. I don't know where I heard this. But it stuck with me. And it goes like this. Your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are the seed. You can plant flowers or you can plant weeds. So many times we doubt God into the heart and the seeds of our heart and we plant unbelief. Really you're asking yourself this question. Is Jesus enough? When Jesus is all you have, you'll find, come to find out Jesus is all you needed. One breath into glory, and you'll know that your eternity will be perfect because God made it that way. And this time here is a proving ground. We're pilgrims. This is not our home. This is temporary. We're just walking through. And every day we get the opportunity to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. Cast your cares upon Him. He loves. He loves you. Sometimes in my own life, this is the way I picture it. I see a loving God with His arms extended who wants to do so very much for me. But my unbelief takes his loving arms and ties it behind his back. Nothing can limit my God except when I don't trust him, when I don't allow him to do. The first temptation that Satan came against Jesus was Take matters into your own hands. You take care of it. You do it. And us control freaks, us people who know better, us people who have all the answers, us people <laughs> who only realize how limited we are after the fact. You think we've figured it out, don't you? I told this story to some of you. My dad was a preacher, a God-fearing man. He loved the Lord. And in his latter years, my dad was about 5'8", five, 5'7", five, five, In his latter years, he had basically lost his sight. But he didn't ever stop doing anything. He built, built the biggest deck you'd ever seen in your life. It wobbled every now and again, but he built it. He would grow a garden. Sometimes I wondered if he was pulling the plant or pulling the weeds. I don't know. He planted corn. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about when I say trucker's favorite. And it's a big tall, it's a field corn, white corn, grows tall. He, uh, you know, sometimes here in northeast Georgia, it can get dry. It can get dry. And my dad just went out there and said, Lord, this is your garden. You have provided it. You're going to have to grow it. I'll do my part, but God, you've got to do yours. Lord, send rain. I'm not trying to make him out as a saint, though he was a child of God. But he would pray for rain, and guess what? It would rain. Not always everywhere, but it would rain there. I got a picture of my dad, all five foot seven of him, with about 12 foot corn. Some of the prettiest corn you've ever seen in your, all, in your life. And it didn't bother my dad. And I come to realize it didn't bother my God. My dad just learned that he could trust God and God would provide. 
whatever the need was, he knew God could provide. I wonder, all this worrying that we do, all this fretting when our heart's running at a thousand RPMs and our stomach's churning and the sweat comes and we become so fearful and we want to be in charge, we want to be in control, we want to make it right. Or we could just have the peace that goes beyond all understanding and learn to just let God be God.